Now, ANC presidential hopeful Dr. Zulim Kiza is bemoaning the party's handling of the Palapala report. He said the NEC meeting on Monday did not do justice to the matter and calls for it to be revisited as it was unilaterally cut short due to differing views. Dakota Lehuete is an ANC, NEC and NWC member. He's also on Dr. Mkiza's campaign management team and he joins us now in studio for a conversation about this and other issues. Mr. Lehuete, thank you so much for making time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sir. I want us to start with the important week that this is for the ANC. You're holding the elective conference uh, starting on Friday, uh, but there's so much happening. Uh, there are some uh, branch members that are raising concerns around irregularities when it comes to how the electoral committee did its work. You've got divisions around how matters like Palapala have been dealt with. Uh, do you get a sense that the focus on Friday from Friday is going to be on the actual issues conference needs to deal with? Or are we likely to see these divisions we're seeing now playing themselves out at Nazrek? Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon to all the viewers at home. Look, uh, we are at a crossroad now as the African National Congress uh, in that we have to prioritize our national interest more than our personal interest because uh, the challenge we have today, including of corruption, including of uh, unethical and immoral behavior that you see within our ranks, comes as a result that we have uh, subsumed the national interest uh, by personal interest, which is characterized by greed, by a mafia-style leadership, uh, by corruption, and by all the wrong things. And I think as a movement and as a nation, we need to redeem ourselves from that because the challenge is that we have made abnormal things normal. We are defending the indefensible. Like what? I will make you just an example that uh, uh, in Pumalanga, in one of the testing stations there, uh, driving school uh, owners mm. were marching that uh, a bribe can be increased for their learners to pass a driver's license. Mm. I mean, you can look at that. Uh, yeah. It tells you that there's a problem. Mm. Uh, in how we think as a society. And uh, the other thing is that uh, there are serious allegations against many of our leaders, mm. including just the two of our presidential officials, both uh, President Ramaphosa and Zolim Kize. There are serious allegations against them, from yeah. uh, Palapala to digital vibes. Yeah. And, and some of these things, we can't treat them as normal, because uh, the presidency is the highest office in the land, and whoever who occupies that office needs to be one of the best descendants uh, our country can offer. Mm. And, and I think those are things that we need to look at. But the other thing is to reduce our breakthrough of 1994 uh, for our people only to RDP houses, social grants, and some uh, student bursaries when we are not actually dealing with the commanding heights of the economy in terms of who owns the financial sector, who owns our mining, mm who owns our land, who owns our buildings. All those particular things are things that we need to get into yeah. before our freedom gets to be uh, boycotted by our own people because yeah. we are reducing them only to beneficiaries of social crimes yeah. than owners of the economy. Let's look at both those two top presidential contenders. Um, Zulim Kize is not happy with how the NEC deliberated on the independent panel report on Palapala and of course the decision that was subsequently taken to instruct members of parliament to vote against that report <coughs> and he says that this matter was handled mafia style. Is that the sense that you got in the NEC? Look, uh, maybe if you talk of inconsistency, I would understand because he, he might be talking from personal experience that when the story of digital vibes came about he opted uh, to step aside from his cabinet responsibilities. Yeah, some people say he was actually pushed out. Well, uh, he waited until the last day when the president was actually announcing his new cabinet to decide, oh, let me step away. Yeah, but, How uh, ethical is that? Yeah, well, well, it was good that he did that because uh, uh, we have a challenge now. Uh, the panel report, uh, some are saying it must be rejected. Mm. Uh, the panel report... Uh, the Chief Justice to, and members of the panel have been openly cyber-bullied. You would see in Twitter and Facebook 
a lot of wrong things and crap are said about our jurists. They are being intimidated. And, and, and it's something that we can promote, including parliamentarians, the speaker and other parliamentarians are being intimidated. And that is something that we can encourage as a democracy because we will be degenerating into a mafia state where jurists are intimidated, where parliamentarians are intimidated, where cabinet members are intimidated. And the other thing that is a very problem, problematic is when an office of court, uh, in the form of my former TG, says uh, that the Chief Justice report is conkelwerk. Now, again, of Africans, mm. I guess, earlier than Africans, conkel means mediocrity, mediocre job. Now, a jurist can say that to another jurist. That's a, a, a derogatory in terms of legal profession. And I think the sooner uh, Comrade TG apologizes to the Chief Justice, the better, because you can't uh, undermine uh, each other to that level if we are a self-respecting mm. nation, if we take our legal profession and our jurist mm. serious. Because the threat is that uh, you make it possible for ordinary community members to refuse judgments, to intimidate magistrates, to intimidate judges, and, and what type of a society will, will mm. we be where jurists are intimidated? So you think Paul Mashatile must apologize? No, no, uh, Matthew Posa. Matthew Posa, uh, yeah, the former Posa. TG. The former TG. Okay, I want to make an argument, Mr. Lechwete, that this is an atmosphere that you've created as the ANC. This is not the first time that um, the judiciary is under attack. You remember... Uh, the former president, Jacob Zuma, at some point had to meet with the chief justice at the time, Mokweng um, Mokweng, because Gwede Mantashe and, and many other senior leaders in the organization were attacking judges. So why is it that now you are here protecting the judiciary when in the past, even when they came out with their report on Nkandla, you guys were very tough on the judiciary. How is that different now? Look, uh, you may be tough in terms of perspective, you may be tough in terms of opinion, opinion, but to put on Twitter or Facebook or even to say conkel verk, uh, that's just too long. Uh, but if you say uh, I'm taking something on review because of the following loopholes, it's understandable. But besides, uh, for any uh, democracy to thrive and survive, we need the judiciary. And in any democratic state, in particular where there is a constitutional democracy, the court is the final bit of any dispute in society. Mm. And in this case, in the, even on the matter of Jacob Zuma and Parliament and the EFF, the court made it very clear that uh, it's the responsibility of Parliament to hold the executive accountable, in particular the president. It mm. even went as far as to say parliamentarians are elected by the public and they are accountable to the public. And yet you as the NEC have just told members of parliament and told them do not vote for the establishment of that committee. You are going against what the constitutional court was trying to encourage. I, I would not want to encourage any disrespect to the administrators of law and justice or second guess their work. That court order stands. What we can do is to lobby our parliamentarians behind the scenes for me to say it in public, I can't. I will be in contempt of the court. No, you're not in court. contempt of the court. I'm asking as a matter of principle. You've mentioned to me now that the Constitutional Court, in fact, said Parliament failed in its constitutional obligation to hold the executive accountable. Right? you mentioning that. I'm saying to you now that as the NEC, you've come out to tell members of Parliament to vote against a process that would allow President Saru Ramaphosa to answer to the allegations. And if he's cleared in his innocent, he's going to be cleared. If he's found guilty, he's going to be found guilty. You are not allowing members of parliament to act according to their oath, which is to the Republic and to the Constitution. You want them to remember that they are hired by you as the ANC. And I'm saying that contradicts the spirit of what the Constitutional Court said back in 2016. Yes, if we say it in public, we'll be in contempt of the court order because there is an order that speaks against that. What we can do if we are to uh, instruct our members in terms of the party line is to do it in caucus so that it gets debated mm. and it gets understood by all. But uh, to, to uh, enforce it or impose it, it will be against what the concord has ruled against. And 
And obviously, as the governing party, it's in our interest that there should be stability, there should be a rule of law, there should be a respect to the institutions of the state. And we can't promote anything other than what we are supposed to do, uh, which we have taken the oath of. Mm. Uh, some of us as members of parliament. Yeah, and the question is, what should members of parliament do then next week? We're going to have that uh, conversation and touch on many other issues when we come back. Stay with us here on Newsroom Africa. Welcome back. We're in conversation with Dakota Lakhoyete, who is an ANC, NEC, and NWC member. Uh, he's also on uh, Dr. Zuelim Kivza's campaign management team. Mr. Lakhoyete, you were saying earlier that um, members of parliament cannot be bullied um, in a sense. So what's your advice to a member of parliament who's going to be sitting in parliament on Tuesday and is expected to vote? Do they follow the party's instruction or must they do what the constitutional court encouraged back in 2016, 2017? Look, uh, we are a constitutional democracy. But within that constitutional democracy, there's what we call proportional representation in terms of elections, where parties contest for elections and where parties deploy, and where parties can give instructions to your members in terms of what policy directions they need to take. And I think parties are allowed to own that. But what the court made it very clear is that uh, members are members of parliament elected by South Africans. They are first and foremost accountable to the republic, secondly to the party. So I think members of the ANC will be going to parliament it's upon their uh, mandate to ensure that the party line is taken, but the party line must be taken if it's within the law. But is it within the law? It's a matter that uh, I think the caucus has the capacity to discuss it. But the caucus has and already uh, been instructed. It's not a decision of caucus. No, no, no there was never a caucus seat in the last time. The caucus is still has to sit because but it's the you. matter was postponed. But the, the NEC is the highest decision-making body in between conferences. You have decided they have to vote in a particular way. Whatever the caucus decides can override the NEC decision. So I'm asking, based on that NEC decision, is that the right way to go? Because caucus can't say, oh no, we're not going to do that. They can't. Look, uh, party lines are in every party. So it is the right way to go if they agree as a caucus. But party lines is what's led us here in South Africa. The State Capture Commission's report talks of how because of members of parliament being expected to follow the party line, we are in the trouble that we're in. We experienced state capture because of that. They couldn't investigate Bosasa in parliament because as the ANC, you told them, no, let's not do it. They couldn't investigate the Guptas. When ESCOM corruption was raising its ugly head, there are members of parliament who wanted an investigation. And the ANC was saying, no, let's not do it until ultimately that was, that was done. The point I'm making is, so many times, and the State Capture Report attests to this, members of parliament were instructed to take the party line. And because of that, we found ourselves in a, in a serious problem in this country where corruption was rife, where state capture was rife. And you are encouraging members of parliament to continue with the same. That's why I said uh, they will have to look at the balance of what this way. Because the allegations which are brought in, on a matter of Palapala, which actually does not even affect the party. It's a crime that happened in a private property, and uh, it's a crime where the private property was allowed to become a currency. Mm. But the only difference is that this particular uh, crime scene is a property that belongs to the president of the ANC and the president of the country. Now, what needs to happen? Those are options that uh, members of parliament need to work on. But on the matter of the party line, it must be clear, we can as a party encourage allegations, protect allegations which are very serious and damning uh, on any manner or uh, any leader of the NC or any member. We have not done it with Zuelim Kize, we have not done it with Isma Kashule, we have not done it with a number of leaders. We allow them uh, to use their individual prerogative to defend their cases. And I think it's a similar problem with the current case of the president. Because we can't drag the whole of the NC into a private matter which happened in a private property where allegations are made of money laundering, I mean smuggling foreign currency in any law or in any country. It's a serious offense. In Mozambique recently, even a son of a former president was found guilty for such uh, allegations. And, and we can't allow them at the highest office of our land. Yeah. I fully agree on that one, that uh, uh, we can't defend the indefensible. 
But the point of the debate as a matter of principle is that parties are allowed space to can make their decisions, and I think the same must be allowed to the African national. But I'm a little confused because uh, I just feel like there's contradictions here. You're saying we can't allow the ANC to be dragged. Um, you're saying members of parliament must make the balance and remember that their oath is to the republic and the constitution, but at the same time you're saying we must also allow that, given our electoral system, parties are allowed to instruct their MPs. So what are you saying exactly? Should the MPs, do you think, is right for them to vote to reject this report? Because when you reject this report, and they've got the majority, we are not going to get the details of what happened at Palapala. What the vote can do if they say yes to the report, there's an impeachment process that takes place. That's going to give President Cyril Ramaphosa and other parties that are involved here a chance to come and prove their innocence. Or we, they will be proven that they're guilty of something. We're not going to have that process because you as the ANC have chosen to protect him through voting against the report. No, look, uh, we, the matter, I think, is before Parliament. This panel is a creature of parliamentary process to want to hold the executive accountable. And I think as a party, this particular process, we supported it. We brought in the impeachment rules uh, in Parliament, and, and they are starting to work. And I think we must allow Parliament to do its work. And, and I think as a party, that is some of the things we need to look at. Okay. And, and, and I think uh, that's how we must allow the matter to proceed. Uh, I would not encourage any member of Parliament to reject the report, uh, because this is a parliamentary process. It's within their authority as an assembly and a legislature to make this particular decision. All right. Why did the Integrity Commission's report on Palapala Pala not dealt with by the NEC? Why are you moving that to conference? Look, uh, the, the, in terms of the terms of reference of the Integrity Commission, the uh, Integrity Commission can report either to the National Executive Committee, to the National General Council, or to the National Conference. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, in this regard, because the report did not come to the NEC, and from the NEC, there is no National General Council that can sit, only a National Conference. So Why did the report not come before the NEC? The Integrity Commission met with the President, I think, for the first time in July. I don't remember the last time they've dealt with an issue for so long, and they've not produced a report. Yeah, there's uh, something quite strange in this regard, and that's why, as the NEC, we said at least we still have an opportunity, uh, which is allowed through the wind of the terms of reference of the Integrity Commission, that the report can be brought to a national conference, if so allowed by conference from plenary, by the way because uh, we don't have an agenda item in the, uh, in the conference uh, uh, agenda that we have adopted. Are you expecting a report on Zolim Kiza as well and Digital Vibes from the same committee? Uh, I think the report on Zolim Kiza, it has long, it came. Zolim Kiza has appealed to the outcomes of that particular report and where it stands now, it's also for the Integrity by, by Commission. By report, you mean to SIU or the Integrity Commission? The report? Integrity Committee. W what did it say, please remind us, on Zolim Kiza? It, it, it said that you must step aside from the cabinet, and, and that it did, but it made an appeal. Uh, he, and he took it also to parliamentary process where it, it was cleared. Where it's left, it's with the SIU and the mm. other state institutions which are dealing with law enforcement. Do you think... Let me ask it this way. Does the ANC still use the eye of the needle document to elect its leaders? Yes, we still use the, through what the does eye it, of the... What does it require? What are the conditions that a leader must meet before they can stand for a position? And do you think Zolim Kize and Cyril Ramaphosa meet those expectations and conditions? Yes. Look... Uh, what the ANC requires from a leader is to have somebody who's honest, who's loyal, who's upright, who has love for his country and his people, to look at somebody like uh, President Oliver Tambo, President Mandela, somebody who, when in a leadership position, is able to be impartial, is able to be uh, somebody who's self-respecting, ethical, uh, beyond, ethical reproach. beyond reproach, all those things are are what we need uh, from a lead of the NC. Is Zolim Kize meeting those conditions? 
so far according to branch nominations. Uh, no, not branch uh, nominations. What I've realized about, with all due respect, Mr. Lohoyd, about ANC members, many of them in branch nominations, is that scandals are never, I mean, unethical behavior is never going to buy you from becoming any leader of the ANC. In fact, it, it sometimes appears like the more scandalous you are, <laughs> the more support you get from the branches. So I don't want us to base it on what the branch nominations are saying. I want us to base it on a document that you as the ANC adopted and said, this is what's going to guide us before we elect leaders, which is the eye of the needle. And I've gone through it myself. Hence, I'm asking you, as an ANC member who knows this document and how strict the conditions are, do you think Zolim Kize stands the test of the eye of the needle? With allegations that are there against him, uh, I don't think so. With the allegations which are there against uh, President Salvador Matposa, I don't think so. So why are they but standing so far, for leadership? Uh, the processes, has, uh, the horses has bolted, branches nominated, and the electoral committee has confirmed. And so far, uh, the only uh, final arbiter would be branch delegates inside conference through the ballot to decide who must lead the African National Congress. The matter related to allegations against the two leaders it's a matter that I think even at conference, even nationally, even in the country, we need to embark on a dialogue on some of the possibility that is this uh, uh, capable characters in terms of the best descendants of the land who can represent us in these serious offices. It's a matter that we need to embark on or engage on a dialogue on uh, because allegations against the two leaders are very serious mm -hmm. and as a self-respecting nation, it's a matter that we need to get to the dialogue and to the conference I guess floor. my worry is you are depending on the same ANC members who voted for or nominated Batabile Lamin, even with what the court said and said she must be in the NEC. Tony again. And these are the same ANC members you are telling South Africans to trust with the decision of electing the top leaders in the governing party. I, I think we need to get to the point of consistency and also not be selective in the application of the rule uh, and the laws. Indeed, but Tabulet Lamin was found guilty for perjury in a court of law. Mm. She was given uh, an option of a fine which she paid. And now, the same laws, even the constitution of the ANC mm. in the rule 25.17.2 Amongst things that he puts as a misconduct, mm. it's clear in that rule 25.17.2, you can look at it, mm. that uh, once we have been given an option of a fine, that can be treated as a misconduct. And where you are given a sentence more than six, 12 months, uh, that is a serious misconduct. But mm. she was given uh, an option of a fine, which allows a... Tony Ngeni went through a correctional services, he was sentenced, uh, for the allegations on the arms deal, went to serve a jail term. He was released over 10 years ago. I mean, why now would we be retrospective in the application of something that somebody was sentenced mm. for, was found guilty? It became double jeopardy because he went through a correctional service. But this is based on, on, this is based on the, the, the rules that were approved by the NEC. Uh, my understanding is that any member may stand for the NEC if they've been an active member, right? But they may not contest for the position. I'm reading from the letter that the Electoral Committee sent to Batavi Lidlameni, um, where they are challenging what she says. And they say, no one may contest ANC elections for leadership if they have been found guilty of or have been charged with unethical or immoral conduct or any other serious crime or corruption. A serious crime that is defined by the, um, <coughs> by the Electoral Committee as a crime that could result in a prison sentence of no longer than six months. A charge is defined being a charge in a court of law. And all of this was approved by the NEC. Yes, it was approved by the NEC. Uh, just on the matter of Pantabile, mm. she was not in prison for six months. Yeah. But secondly, is that the rules in terms of the ANC protocols, are not bigger than the Constitution. Mm. The Constitution set aside uh, to say what would be a misconduct or what would be a sanction mm. that warrants somebody who did a particular uh, okay. a, a crime. In a case, she was given an option of a fine, which okay. allows her to be an active member because 
punishing her again, it will be a double jeopardy because already mm -hmm. a court of law, which is a final arbiter in society of any dispute, has okay. found her and has uh, meted a sentence of a fine against her. Right. So we can't bring it again now. Uh, right. It's a matter that we need to look at as society also. That once somebody has been sentenced, correctional services have been done, or fines have been paid, mm. we can't come again and yeah. say, uh, still, uh, all the time, we must say you are a murderer, even if you went through a corrective yeah. uh, measures. We're going to wrap up the conversation when we come back. Let's take a quick air break. Welcome back. We are wrapping up our conversation with Dakota Lehuete, who is the ANC, NEC, and NWC member. Mr. Lehuete, I have interviewed Mondli Kungubele on the show, um, who runs the campaign for Cyril Ramaphosa. I've also interviewed um, the Minister of the Minister of Human Settlements, Mamulu Kukubai, on this show. And both of them told me that they don't think that the ANC can do well in 2024 at the elections if Cyril Ramaphosa is not the face of the campaign. In other words, if there's anybody else who comes and becomes president and it's not Cyril Ramaphosa, the ANC doesn't stand a chance in 2024. Do you agree with that characterization? No, that characterization, uh, it can't find any expression in history of the African National Congress. We've, well, we've had one of the most brilliant, revered, respected leader called President Oliver Tambo. You know one thing strange about Oliver Tambo is that in 1938, he passed metric with A in maths and A in physics without a laboratory. That leader carried the ANC for over 30 years in exile. He handed over the ANC after 1990 to all of us today. The ANC, Oliver Tambo passed on, it still exists. So it's not true that the fortunes of the NC are dependent on an individual leader. We come and go as leaders, the NC remains, is now 110 years. So that story is just a fallacious, an attempt to mislead and put up a panic and a trauma to society because as leaders of the NC, we must know we are the governing party. Whatever we say out of our own words of volition, can bring trauma to society. But his popularity is still more compared to that of the ANC. Monty Gugubela says there's a research document that was presented to the NEC that shows that he leads in popularity by 7% from the party. Look, that is a creature of the ANC created by the ANC. Once you assume a responsibility of that office being brought by the ANC, which is the governing party, you will get to that particular percentage and statistics. But once the position is not there, or the NC is not there, I don't think the same will happen. So no, it's it not will. With Zuma, it happened. It is not with true. Jacob, Jacob Zuma was not... I mean, there was a time when Jacob Zuma, when you look at popularity levels, especially in areas like maybe even Gauteng, you could see that he wasn't too popular. Look, we must liberate the NC from political demagogues and... Uh, some of us who think we can grow bigger than the NC. We were taught in the NC that we must understand that the NC is bigger than all of us. We are there to pursue a cause called the National Democratic Revolution and a national interest of bringing a better life to our people. It has never been about self-aggrandizement or personal glory. It has always been about the cause, the national interest, and the historical mission. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's correct for any leader of the NC to want to put any individual leader of the NC above the NC because the NC is a movement, it's a cause. Mm -hmm. It's not something that is a personal fiefdom mm -hmm. of, or a property or a farm of somebody. We have the responsibility to create jobs as a governing party to ensure that we bring about public safety because South Africans are traumatized by the level of crime, of drugs, of Nyaupe on our streets. We need to ensure that we bring education to our children. We bring water and salt to our people. We feed our nation because any government that fails to feed this nation, it does not deserve legitimacy. And we are degenerating to that particular level, including to a level of likely to become a mafia state because you saw today with our treasure general, there's a story of extortion and obviously because we are going to a conference, 
Mm. Many scandals will, would be brought in, in this week to try to dislodge or disorientate some of the leaders or to get them on step aside. And such tabloid politics cannot be encouraged in a democracy. Some mafia tendencies of cyberbullying people or of bullying people, of, of intimidating people, mm. extortion, threatening people with pornography, with everything, mm. is not correct. What is the official response? And I don't know if you've had a conversation with Paul Mashatile, but the story you're referring to is in the papers today. And they are saying that he was in love with someone else. Um, and that person is threatening to expose the details of their relationship. And I think what's more concerning here is that this lover or alleged lover is claiming that there was money that was donated to the ANC, which the Treasurer General took and gave it to her. And some of the money was stashed in an envelope that even had an ANC emblem. And, and this is very serious because the ANC has been struggling to pay salaries. And if this is true, that means if the money really has been coming in, being donated, but it was used by the Treasurer General to give to some women out there, it's, it's going to be serious. Do you, are you suggesting that this is completely fabricated? Look, I, I would not speak with uh, authority that it's a uh, fabrication. But what I can speak with authority on is that uh, on the allegations said that state security is involved, I think it would be correct for the TG to refer the matter to the uh, Inspector General of Intelligence if there is any other case which uh, uh, the lady has, uh, I'm sure she can bring it forward before the law enforcement agencies uh, so that that particular matter be dealt with. But my biggest concern is how, when we are in office, can attempt to bring state institutions into disrepute to fight our political battles or our factional uh, matters in the ruling party. The matter of abuse of authority has been a matter of concern mm. within the NC, in particular on the eve of conferences, because there is nothing much here except to want to get Paul Marshall on step aside so that he must not contest next week. And I don't think it's correct. Why all the time this matter was not brought up? Why is it brought up on the eve of conference? And obviously, you must expect this week, mm. uh, in terms of tabloid politics, to be very dirty. Because everybody who's a candidate, everybody who's standing, anything can be done against them, either through cyberbullying or either through any other form of intimidation, mm. to want to get to them. So what I'm saying, whether digital vibes, whether pala pala, the horses has bolted, let's allow the process to go to conference, allow branch delegates mm. to decide on who must okay. lead the course of the revolution. Last question, Mr. Lahoyte. Given what you've just explained now, you've painted a party that is in disarray. Is this organization still worthy of someone's vote who's watching us now, who's a South African? Are you worthy of a vote, given how in disarray you are, given all the concerns you've even raised about how you're treating each other, given the failures in government, uh, given the instructions that go to members of parliament who have made an oath to the Republic and the Constitution, and it's like you're repeating the same mistakes even after the Concord judgment. Given all of that, is the ANC still worthy of a vote from South Africans? Indeed, it's very worthy of the South African votes because the ANC is the only heritage we have that has led the course of struggle against apartheid colonialism. The only mistake that is happening now is that the good cause by the NC, which is a national interest of bringing a better life to our people, a national interest has been subsumed by individual and personal interest of greed, of self-enrichment, of self aggrandizement of negativity. And where does this leave us as South Africans? We are being caught where, up in all of that. Yeah, where, where it leaves us is for branches of the NC and members of the NC when they get to a conference to do a correct thing. The same branches yes. who said Zuelim Keys and, and Cyril Ramaphosa, whom you accept, don't meet the test of the eye of the needle, must be, get the most nominations. You, you are Look, uh, these are allegations. They have not been formally charged. That's why 
uh, I would say that because we must also acc accord them uh, their okay. rights as citizens. Because if you have not been formally charged, we can't say. If you have yeah. not, there's no finding against yeah, you. Yeah, that, that's why there's but, legal but principles, there are ethical principles. Legal principles, you can say you are innocent until proven guilty. Ethical principles, which is what you as the ANC, as the leader of society, claim to represent is there are serious allegations around me. I'm going to step aside, and I don't mean step aside from what you have um, resolved at conference. No. You decide, I'm going to step aside, not because... NEC instructs me to, not because integrity commission instructs me to, because I'm an ethical leader who realizes how serious the allegations are. We've not seen that in the organization. Yes, we have not seen that in the organization uh, in, with some of the leaders, but with some. They are leaders of the NC who, when things came up about them, like who? Decided. Who was never forced? Who? There are many. I mean, uh, even himself, Rimkiz, uh, Paolo Jordan. You can name a number of leaders who, when things were brought up against them, on their own, out of their own consciousness, they, they decided to step aside and allow the NC to continue with its work. So I think that depends on the individual consciousness of a leader. Because when we lead, there is a certain level of development and mm -hmm. consciousness that we have to uphold. And one okay. of it is to be upright. When you, have found yourself, when you find yourself in a compromised position. But now what has become a problem is that some of us, when we are found in a compromised position, we go and mobilize, divide the organization, divide society, and that is not correct. It's something that I think as a conference, as a society, we need to debate also because we have uh, outsourced as a society our agency to individual leaders, and that's why today we have a problem, because they can bully us, because they know their favorites, or they know they are liked, but they don't look at what their liking yeah. or their favoritism can put us into as a catastrophe, how it can drag back our national interest, how it can derail our progress, even to deal with matters of education, of yeah. unemployment, of yeah. health, of public safety, and so on and Mr. so forth. Because uh, the challenge is that uh, yeah. we need patriots. All these leaders who are going to be elected, can we be patriots? Can we reduce ourselves and individual interest to the national interest so that we serve everybody? Because it can be that this freedom mm. that took so many lives, it's only mm. benefiting the few the and the their question. families. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. As we look ahead to that all-important elective conference starting on Friday. Stay with us.